Well, it's a it's a real real pleasure for me to um to introduce Ying Yin today for our tenth epic seminar. So it really feels like a, a little celebration. Um, so um, it's a really really good fortune to to have worked with Ying for many years. Um, in the lab of Sokyang Li at Duke, and uh, um, yeah, she's one of the most dedicated and sharp scientists that I've ever come across. So it's a real pleasure to have her here with us today. Um, so Ying did her undergrad at UCLA, and then um, she came to Duke to Sokyang Li's lab to do uh, to her PhD. Um, so she finished when she finished her PhD. It was right in the middle of the pandemic, so she stayed uh, for a brief postdoc at Duke. And she recently moved to uh, to Rockefeller to do her second postdoc with uh, Rod McKinnon. Um, her time at Duke was really wildly successful. So she published um, a lot of papers, and amongst them were three first author science papers, which I don't think many of us can now uh, can put on our resume. And uh, um, the work that she did was. Um, some really beautiful stuff on trip M8, which I think she will uh, she will tell us about today. So without further ado, I'll just hand it over to to Ying. Thank you, Leila, for the warm introduction. And um, and I really appreciate the organizing committee for this invitation and very excited today to be here and to share with you the work that I did during my PhD and my first postdoc with uh, Professor Sukyang Lee at the Duke University. So the focus for today will be the activation mechanism of the code and menthol sensor TripMA channel by PIP2 and cooling agonists. Um, there are five basic human senses, vision, smell, somato sensation, hearing, and taste. Okay, so we are particularly interested in studying somato sensation because it is not a single sense, but rather a collection of senses that convey information about the state of our body and the physical interactions between our body and the environment. Somato sensation includes the sensation of temperature, chemicals, and the mechanical forces. And to protect our bodies from potential injury, noxious stimuli from these categories are detected by specialized sensory receptors or proteins in the peripheral nervous systems and which transmit the signals from the environment to the central nervous system to induce the sensation of pain so that our body will stay away from these potential damage. And the major group of these receptor proteins for somatosensory transduction are the transient receptor potential trip channels. The trip channel superfamily consists of a diverse group of cation channels that are permeable to sodium, calcium, and magnesium. There are six subfamilies in mammals which are grouped based on their sequence homology as shown here in this phylogenetic tree. And they are, these channels are widely expressed in various tissues and cell types, and they function in many physiological processes such as vision, taste, touch, and thermal sensation. And all tube channel subunits are predicted to contain six transmembrane helices, transmembrane helices S1 through S6. And following this, Four lining helix S6 is the highly conserved trip domain. The cytoplasmic N and C termini show diversity in both structures and functions across different subfamilies of trip channels. Okay, so several trip channels function as receptors of thermal and chemical stimuli, including trip A1, trip M8, trip M2, trip M3, and trip B1. They are activated by temperatures ranging from noxious cold to warmer temperatures and then noxious temp heat temperatures. And these channels are also sensitive to pungent chemical stimuli. For instance, the pungent wasabi and garlic act on trip A1 channel and mint for trip M8 and hot chili pepper activates trip B1 channel. Therefore, these receptors are capable of integrating multiple thermal and chemical stimuli giving rise to this property of polymodal sensing. And since these channels can sense noxious stimuli from the environment and convert the signal to uh, the stimuli into electric signals and transduce towards higher order sensory system in human body, they play a very important role in pain sensation. And among these channels, the cold sensor trip M8 and the noxious heat sensor trip B1 have attracted a lot of attention in the field and they have been extensively studied. 
At the time when I started the project on the cold sensor trip M8, um, a lot more was known for the capsaicin and noxious heat receptor trip V1. So in 1997, the trip V1 gene was cloned by David, Juli David Julius's group, and the cloning and characterization of trip V1 revealed how sensory neurons detect capsaicin and uh, high temperatures at molecular level. TRIV-1 is a calcium permeable ion channel, and they are expressed in DRG neurons. And um, this channel can be activated by noxious heat temperatures over 42 degrees Celsius, as indicated by this substantial increase in the channel, or the current magnitude in response to temperatures over 40 degrees Celsius. Besides temperature, the valinoid compounds, such as the hot chili pepper ingredient capsaicin and a ultra-potent agonist RTX, as well as low pH can also activate this channel. So the first structure from the trip channel superfamily was reported for trip one using a single particle cryo-electromicroscopy technique. And this channel forms a homotetramer and they can be divided into two layers, the transmembrane domain TMD and the bottom is the cytoplasmic domain. The TMD consists of the voltage sensor like domain VSLD formed by transmembrane helices S1 through S4, and the pore domain is formed by S5, a pore helix, and the pore lining helix S6. The, this VSLD uh, is structurally resembles the voltage sensor in the voltage gated KV, uh, KV channels, uh, voltage gated potassium KV channels. And these two domains are connected by this S45 linker. Um, the trip domain follows the pore lining helix, uh, helix S6 and is positioned below the voltage sensor like domain and the, uh, in parallel to the membrane plane. The cytoplasmic domain contains a largely the anchoring repeats at the end terminus. And a follow up study, a follow up crowd EM study revealed an overlapping binding site for the endogenous phosphatidyl inositol lipid and for the agonist RTX or capsaicin, which is located above this S45 linker. And structural information suggests that this PI lipid function as a competitive antagonist and locks, locks the channel in a closed conformation, while the binding of RTX displaces the endogenous phospholipid and propagates the conformational change to the pore domain and through this S45 linker and uh, op then opens the channel at the S6. So up to this point, we've known the structure and function of trip V1, but then how about its counterpart, the code and menthol receptor trip M8? Okay, so trip M8 is expressed in the periphery effer efferent fibers projected from TG and DRG neurons. It is also um, calcium permeable in channel, and it functions as the principal code sensor for detecting environmental code. And amongst all the somatosensory receptors, receptors, including TRIV-1 and also the mechanosensitive piezo channel, TRIV-8 ex exhibits the most robust knockout phenotype because uh, the TRIV-8 deficient mice showed the severe deficiency in, in code sensing. So in this behavioral test of code sensitivity, both the wild type and TRIV-8 knockout mice were placed in between these two plates. One was held at 30 degrees Celsius, while the other, other side at varying temperatures from noxious cold to hot temperatures. And the time the mice spent on this 30 degree surface was measured with, with respect to varying temperatures on the other side. So the wild type mice um, in gray bars, they, spend, they showed clear preference for the 30 degree surface, warm surface, as the temperature is decreased on the other side. But in contrast, the MA knockout mice spent less time on the 30 degree side and spent, but spent extended period of time on the cold surface and suggesting that the, just suggesting the efficiency, uh, the deficiency in cold sensing in these MA knockout mice. And um, like uh, trip V1, trip MA is also a polymodal end channel. It act, can be activated by the cold temperatures be uh, below 20 degrees Celsius and also by cooling compounds including the naturally occurring compound menthol from the peppermint and also a synthetic supercooling agonist called isolin. And channel function requires the phospholipid PI45P2 and depolar depolarizing membrane potential can also open this channel. So the membrane lipid PIP2 is a key signaling phospholipid that resides in the plasma membrane. And it is required for channel activation 
because the depletion of PIP2 causes decay in TripMA currents. Um, in this inside out patch of hex cells expressing the TripMA channels, the cooling agonist isolin elicited robust current, which is uh, suppressed by, uh, by polyolysin, when, uh, it, which sequestered the endogenous PIP2 from the plasma membrane. And the, this current decay can be rescued when exogenous short chain DICA PIP2 was supplied. So this data indicate that the PIP2 is essential for the channel activation. And um, additionally, higher concentration of PIP2 uh, as high as a 500 micromolar alone can activate this channel. And here we are looking at the dose response of DICA PIP2 and increasing in the presence of increasing concentration of menthol, it shifted the EC50 of a DICA PIP2 to uh, left to the left, suggesting the, the apparent affinity of PIP2 channels, uh, 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 apparent affinity of trip channel, uh, trip MA channels for PIP2 was enhanced by the presence of menthol. Therefore. So this data suggests a allosteric coupling between PIP2 and cooling agonists. So the two most well-studied agonists for TripMA channel are menthol and isolin. And previous functional studies suggested that these two compounds um, activate the channel through different mechanisms. So high throughput screening and mutagenesis showed residues critical for um, menthol and, channel, uh, and isolin activation. They overlap, but they are not identical set of residues. And channel activation by isolin requires um, calcium as a cofactor, which is uh, different from menthol. As a, a, the only by this uh, functional data, only the presence of both isolin and calcium can elicit robust current in, in rat tribamate, whereas um, menthol activation does not require calcium. And what's more interesting is that the isolin sensitivity also shows ortholog dependence. While menthol sensitivity is highly conserved among all the TripMA channels, avian TripMA, which include chicken and bird channels, are insensitive to isolin in the presence of its cofactor calcium. In contrast, to the uh, to mammalian TripMA can be activated by by isolin and calcium. So this it has been shown that this ortholog dependence originates from the difference at this single residue position. And the equivalent residue is corresponds to glycine in human and mouse tripamate. When mutating this alanine, the, the alanine in chicken tripamate to glycine, it confers the isolin sensitivity, as shown by this 4 2 calcium imaging data that the isolin could, could induce uh, increase in intracellular calcium in hex cells expressing this chicken A to G mutant channel. So, um, also, furthermore, there are many studies try to probe the binding sites for menthol, isolin, and, and PIP2. And based on the sequence homology between um, tripamate and trip B1, the transmembrane helices were predicted and the residues that were suggested involved in channel sensitivity to these ligands are mapped here. So these, uh, those, the residues critical channel activation by menthol, isolin, and PIP2 were predicted to locate on transmembrane helices S2, S3, as well as the trip domain. Together with a, a computational docking model, the field predicted that the menthol binding site in trib M8 is analogous to the capsaicin binding site in trib B1, which is near the S2, S3 and facing the, uh, the plasma membrane. Okay, so given all these prior knowledge, so we initiated the project on trib M8 and then we, with the aim to understand the mechanism of ligand and PIP2 dependent activation of, of, of TripMA channel using both structure and functional strategies. For a structure study, we identified a stable target, an, a TripMA ortholog from the bird colorad flycatcher named TripMA FA in 2017. In collaboration with Gabe Lander Lab at Scripps Research Institute, we determined the first cryo-EM structure of TripMA FA in the April confirmation. And the 3D, the crowd EM reconstruction was resolved to an overall resolution of about 4.1 angstrom with local resolutions ranging from 3.8 uh, at the core and to 8 angstrom at the periphery. And we performed the novel model building based on uh, the, uh, the good map quality. And TribMA channel forms a homo tetramer, and the channel can be divided into the three layers, including the top transmembrane domain layer and the bottom two layers form the cytoplasmic domain. 
And for each subunit, the N terminus is composed of this MHR domain, M uh, metastatic homology region, MHR 1, 2, 3, and 4. And this MHR 1, 2 together forms a single domain and it is connected to the MHR 4 through the helix turn helix motifs in the MHR 3 domain. And the transmembrane domain is again separated to the voltage sensor VSLD cavity and uh, voltage vo sensor VSLD domain and uh, the port domain. The trip domain follows S6 and is positioned below the VSLD. And at the C terminus, this long coil coil from, from all four subunits come together and forms a helix bundle, which is positioned along the central axis of this channel. Okay, so we compare the structure of trip MA with trip B1, and we identify distinct structural features in trip M8. So in a transmembrane domain, all the transmembrane helices are straight alpha helices in trip M8, especially this S4 and S5 are straight and they're connected through a sharp turn at this at a conserved uh, proline residue here. And what no, what's worth pointing out is that there is no S4-5 linker. Whereas in trip V1, there's a bending point in S5 and there is a S4-5 linker between the VSLD and the port domain. And additionally, uh, the non-alpha uh, alpha helical conformation, including three pi, uh, sorry, 310 and pi helices were found in the S4 S4 and S5 linker and S6 in trip V1. These energetically unfavorable non-alpha helical con configurations have been shown involved in gating in many ion channels. Uh, for instance, the 310 helix was shown as important for voltage sensing in KV channels and previous work from our lab put forth the critical roles of pi helices on S4, S5 linker and S6 for the trip channel gating. So we think this APO conformation that we capture for trip M8 is likely energetically the a stable con con most stable conformation. And we predict that, predicted that during channel gating, the transmembrane helices in trip M8 may likely undergo conformational change from alpha to 310 or pi, pi helices. So in order to unambiguously um, um, identify the binding site for PIP2 and cooling agonists and to understand the mechanism of channel activation. In our follow-up study published in 2019, we determined cryo-EM structures of flag catcher trip M8 in complex with PIP2 and two different cooling agonists. One is a isolin and calcium. Another one is a, a, a menthol analog WS12. So the cryo EM re reconstruction were resolved to 3.4 and 4, and 4 Enstrom resolution, respectively. And as I introduced in the earlier slides, it was predicted that by it predicted by functional study and computational modeling that the agonist binding site in tripamide is located at a membrane facing surface on uh, around um, S2 and S3. However, our structures show that the cooling agonists like isolin and WS12 bind within a cavity formed by the voltage sensor-like domain VSLD and the trip domain underneath. So we call this, this binding site the VSLD cavity. And adjacent to the cooling agonist the binding site, PIP2 binds to a membrane interface formed by multiple subdomain located here. So here I'm using isolin as an example to demonstrate the ag agonist binding in trip M8 channel. So in a ESLD cavity, isolin molecule is surrounded by all these a lot of many ar aromatic residues, including tyrosine 745 on S1 and tyrosine 104 on the trip domain, which was predicted important for menthol and isolin sensitivity by earlier functional study. And additionally, we identified two more residues that form prominent, prominent interactions with isolin, which are this arginine 841 and histidine 844 located at the C terminus of S4, which we call S4B. And calcium binds in proximity to isolin within this cavity, but it does not form direct interactions with isolin. And cal calcium ion is coordinated by these four highly conserved residues in trip M subfamily of ion channels, including two acidic residues and two uh, another two polar residues. And the so the binding configuration of isolin and calcium in the VSLD cavity raises two questions. So what is the role of calcium in isolin recognition? 
And why is the A2G mutation on the S3 is required to confer insulin sensitivity to BERT tryptamine channels? So to answer these questions, we compared the insulin complex structure colored in blue with the APO structure colored in yellow. So in the APO conformation, this um, uh, this aspart uh, aspartic, aspartic acid 802 and arginine 841 form a salt bridge and they occupy the, the center of the cavity where isolate molecule binds. The binding of calcium moves this coordinating residue aspartate away from, from arginine and breaks the interaction in between. So it also induces a rotation about 15 degree at the end terminus of S3. As a result of this calcium binding, the VSLD cavity is widened to accommodate the isolate molecule and also allows this arginine side chain to, to reposition to below the, the, the isolate central ring in the, of the isolate to form an interaction with the molecule. And additionally, the residue 805 uh, located on uh, it, one about one helical turn above the calcium coordinate of uh, calcium binding site, and in avian tribamate, the the side chain alanine uh, would clash with the hydro hydroxyphenol ring moiety in the isolin. So mutation of this alanine to to glycine would reduce the clash with the isolin molecule and provides more space for the for to fit the isolin molecule in the binding site. And additionally, the uh, uh, glycine, if having a glycine residue here, it would also confirm more flexibility for the end terminus of S3 to rotate in order to assemble the calcium coordination site. And addition, and furthermore, we also we also observed structural rearrangements at the C terminus of S4. Uh, yes, the C terminus of S4 uh, undergoes alpha in the APO conformation to a 310 helix in the uh, complex structure um and yeah so and and it results in a register shift at the histidine and arginine residue which allow them to form interaction with isolin in the vsld cavity so in summary the coordination of calcium ion facilitates isolin binding in the vsld cavity and the, this a2g mutation reduces clash with the isolin molecule and confers flex flexibility at S3 for assembling the calcium coordination site. Okay, so the, the PIP2 binding site is located at the interface between the transmembrane domain and the top layer of the cytoplasmic domain. This interfacial cavity is assembled by S4 from S4 from the, the VSLD and TRIP domain and the pre-S1 domain, as well as, well as a, the MHR4 domain from the neighboring subunit. So if we take a closer look at the binding site, the phosphate hat groups from, uh, form electrostatic interactions with arginine and lysine residues from each of these subdomains. So we mutated these, uh, these lysine, res uh, lysine or arginine residues to glutamine and the mutations impair the channel function. Three of them right shifted the GV curve towards more positive membrane potential because PIP2 binding and membrane depolarization are coupled for a tribamate gating. So increase in the voltage Required for opening this channel suggests a reduced apparent affinity of the channel for PIP2. So what I want to uh, point it out is that this lysine 806 in the MHR4 domain is particularly important because PIP2 binding is not just through interaction with the transmembrane domain, but also engages the cytoplasmic domain through, S uh, through MHR4. And mutation of this lysine residues to glutamine uh, showed the most significant effect and most significant redshift in the GV curve. Okay, so to analyze the effect of PIP2 binding, we so we have four structures in hand, which are the ligand-free ligand APO structure in yellow, the WS12 mental analog complex structure in green, and for the isolin complex structure, we have two classes showing both high, showing high, showing high or low occupancy uh, of, of isolin binding. So we superimpose these four structures. And the first three structures adopt the same conformation, which is different from the high occupancy isolin complex structures colored in blue. These, the first three structures have a much wider interfacial cavity for PIP2 binding. 
as exemplified by the WS12 complex structure here, PIP2 molecule only loosely attached to this binding site. Whereas in the high occupancy isolin structure, the PIP2 binds uh, uh, the, the, the Whereas in this uh, high occupancy high occupancy isolin complex structure, it features a much more compact binding site for PIP2, and PIP2 binds much tighter at this site. So this difference in the PIP2 binding configuration comes from the secondary structure change at S4B. In the APOL and WS12 structure, this S4B is a alpha helix, and this arginine one of the PIP2 binding residue is away from the binding site to form direct interaction with PIP2. Therefore, PIP2 only binds very loosely, uh, loosely at this binding site. In, in the isolin complex structure, S4B transitions from alpha to 310, and S4, um, and this arginine is repositioned and uh, goes much lower to closer to the binding site to form direct interaction with PIP2. So there, it, which leads to this much tighter PIP2 binding at the binding site. So we think this PIP2 binding configuration in the high occupancy isolating structure represents a fully engaged PIP2 binding mode. This is important because in this conformation where S4B adopts the 310 helix conformation, it is also favorable for isolating binding as I, as I showed in the earlier slides and also the fully in this fully engaged PIP2 binding in the interfacial cavity tight, tightly couples the all these subdomains from both the transmembrane domain and cytoplasmic domain for a potential channel gating. So we've separately looked at the cooling agonist and the PIP2 binding in the channel. Now we put them together to address the allosteric coupling between the two modulators. So we compare the APO structure in yellow with the uh, uh, isolating complex structure in blue. PIP2 molecule is shown in red here and isolin molecule is shown in darker blue. PIP2 binding is fully engaged when S4B becomes 310 helix and S4, uh, S5 bands to form this S45 linker. Likewise, isolin binding is also more favorable when S4 is 310 helical so that this arginine and he histidine res residue side chain can rotate towards the center of the cavity to form interaction with isolin. So the locations for cooling agonists and uh, PIP2 are, they are located on the opposite faces of, S of S4B. And uh, PIP2 binding facilitates structural rearrangements to accommodate isolin. And conversely, isolin binding induces conformational change favorable for a PIP2 binding. Therefore, PIP2 and cooling agonists, they are coupled to enhance the parent affinity for each other in the channel. And um, on the other hand, as a comparison, we found the distinct binding sites and opposing functional effects of phospholipid between TRIP-M8 and TRIP-V1 channel. So in TRIP-M8, the locations of cooling agonists and PIP2 binding sites are positioned adjacent to each other on the opposite sides of S4B. And this allows for allosteric coupling between binding of these two key modulators of the of, for the channel activation. In contrast, in TRIP-V1, the binding sites for valinoid agonist overlaps with the endogenous phosphatidyl inositol PI lipid, and this PI lipid acts as a competitive antagonist and locks the channel in a closed conformation. Therefore, we've shown that trip m 8 utilizes a synergistic binding of PIP2 and cooling agonists at different sites for channel activation, where, which is in contrast to the competition between the valinoid agonists and endogenous inhibitory PI lipid for a common binding site in TRIP-V1. So as a partial summary, so far we have determined the uh, architecture of the flag catcher trip m 8 and we identify the binding sites for PIP2 and cooling agonists in trip m 8 channel, and we showed two modes of PIP2 binding configuration and we, um, our structure study illustrated the allosteric coupling between PIP2 and cooling agonists. But there are still several other issues remain to be addressed. Although the two ligand bound uh, complex structure we, we, we reported adopt different conformations, the poor domain and the X6 gating residues were not clearly defined in these structures. Therefore, we were not able to interpret the ligand dependent gating mechanism for this channel. And there are also functional differences and potential structural discrepancy between bird, avian, and, and mammalian trip channels. 
So for the next part of our work, we changed our focus to go back to mammalian channels and established mouse tripamid as our model system for our study. Okay, so a uh, paper from Tom, Tom's voice lab, they uh, classified tripamid agonists as either type one menthol-like or type two aleoisothiocyanate AITC-like type of agonists. They analyzed the effects of these two types of uh, 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 types of agonists on tripamid gating kinetics and found that Type 1 agonist slowed the deactivation kinetics, um, whereas the type 2 AITC like uh, agonist accelerated the activation kinetics. So, these differential effects suggest that type 1 may stabilize the open state of tripamate, while the type 2 may destabilize the closed state, uh, state of the channel. In the, in, the, in the meantime, we in order to capture the ligand bound open state structure of tripamate, we have tried um, various tripamate agonists, including the menthol and that we, we used previously. But finally, we came across a novel agonist called Krausen 3, uh, we refer to as C3. And based on our functional characterization, this compound function as a type one menthol like agonist. So with this information, we hypothesized that we could potentially co-apply type 1 and type 2 agonists to achieve a synergistic effect on tripamine activation. So we did the experiments. And in this TVC recording of oocytes expressing mouse tripamine channels, C3 itself can uh, reversely elicit robust inward current. And low concentration of uh, at 0.5 millimolar AITC itself induced very weak channel activation. And when we co-apply C3 and AITC, the combination, the co-application uh, co of both significantly potentiated the, the, the current magnitude, which can, be, can also be fully inhibited by the tripamate specific uh, inhibitor at the end. So, and also the, the parent channel open probability at zero millivolts was significantly increased uh, when C3 and uh, AITC were co-applied as shown in the, by the, the red curve. So based on the functional data, we formed the strategy to co-apply C3 and AITC along with PIP2, which is the, the essential uh, phospholipid for channel activation to the purified tripamate channels for our structure study. So finally, using single particle cryoEM we captured mouse tripamate in distinct conformations along the ligand-dependent gating pathway, including a uh, ligand-free closed C0 conformation and with PIP2 bound in the closed C1 state and with C3, C3 and PIP2 bound in the intermediate C2's closed state and in complex with all three channel activators, including PIP2, C3, and AITC in the open state conformation. And shown at the bottom are the crowd EM reconstructions of the at the ion connection pore at the S6 gate specifically for each conformation. And we're looking at from the extracellular side. And the map quality uh, allowed for unambiguous model building and the, the register of the S6 in order to define the channel conformational state clearly. So we first first again, we first look at the effect of PIP2 binding. The protein purified in the presence of cholesterol hemisuccinate CHS does not show EM density for PIP2 in the interfacial cavity because the CHS occupies the, the binding site for PIP2. But when PIP2 was uh, when protein was purified without CHS but was incubated with PIP2, we could resolve clear PIP2 density in a binding site. So th these two structures adopt drastic conformational change differences, and they have a C alpha RMSD value around five angstrom, which is huge at the transmembrane domain. So that this ligand-free mouse tripamate structure adopts the same conformation as the APO flycatcher tripamate that I showed earlier, uh, which adopts a straight um, S5 and a alpha helical S4B. And this arginine is away from the PIP2 binding site. Whereas in this PIP2 bound, bound structure, S4B becomes 310 and S5 bends to form the S45 linker and PIP2 binding is fully engaged with interactions with different subdomains from TMD and CD. 
we define that the, this apol mouse trip apol mouse a trip MA structure adopts the closed C0 state and PIP2 binding triggers conformational transition to a fully engaged mode in the PIP2 bound structure, which we define as the C1 state. Because PIP2 is present in the plasma membrane and it primes this channel for activation, we think this C1 state represents the physiological ground state of PIP MA, of mouse trip MA channels. And besides PIP2 binding, in the open state reconstruction, we resolved strong EM density for the uh, type 1 cooling agonist C3 in the VSLD cavity, and also strong density for the type 2 agonist AITC, which is outside VSLD, but it's adjacent to S3 and uh, S45 linker. And through mutagenesis and functional validation, we identified key residues in the VSLD, including tyrosine, histidine and arginine, which are involved in C3 binding. And we confirm the AITC binding site through interaction with uh, tryptophan on S3 and this glutamine residue from S45 linker. So, and this is a novel binding site that we showed for type two agonist in tryptm 8 channel. And together we found that ligand binding sites for PIP2 type one agonist, um, such as menthol and C3, and the type two agonists such as AITC, they are they surround this uh, transmembrane helix S4, which plays a critical role in coupling all the ligand binding around VSLD to the port domain through this S45 uh, linker. And this design of PIP2 and agonist binding site on different sides of uh, S4 helix allows for a synergy among these channel activators to open the, this channel. And during channel activation, the pore domain uh, undergoes substantial conformational change. As highlighted by the dashed line here, so we see that the C0 state conformation adopts a very wide set pore and the selectivity filter. And we see substantial decrease in the pore cavity, uh, of pore cavity volume as the channel transitions from C0 to C1 and finally to the open state. And as indicated by the changing electrostatic potential of the pore lining surface, the surface charge distribution in the pore change from, changes from relatively more hydrophobic and neutral in the C0 state towards more negatively charged in the open state. Again, the uh, ion permeation pathway profile also showed the substantial change in the pore cavity during channel gating from C0 to C1 and open state. Uh, what's more important is that these three conformations, conformational states exhibit distinct sets of S6 gating residues. So and the C0 state is gated by this methionine 978 and phenylalanine 979, which form a very thick hydrophobic layer at the S6 gate. And in S the C1 state, it is gated by a phenylalanine 7, a 979 and a valine 983 below. And in the intermediate C2 state adopts the same, uh, uh, same S6 gating configuration as in, S in a C1 state. And the valine 976 uh, gate oh yeah, in the in the is the gate becomes the gate residues in open state. And the diagonal distance between the the opposing valine residues in the open state is over nine angstrom, which allows for ion permeation. And this poor radii profiles comparing these four different conformational states also indicate a gradual decrease in the width uh, in the outer pore and the selectivity filter while a, a wide but wide a widening in the S6 gate when channel goes from C0 to C1 to open state during activation. So to to but because of all the, the all this huge and huge change in S6 gating residues, we want to compare what conformational change does S6 undergo. So now we are looking at the pore lining helix S6 from the membrane plane for each of these conformational states. And this cross symbol uh, represents the, the location of the ion connection pore. And the S6 transition, the S6 gate transition is accompanied by rotation, vertical translation, as well as secondary structure change in the S6 helix. So from C0 to C1, C2, and the C, uh, uh, from, uh, sorry, so from C0 to C1 and C2 state, this entire S6 helix rotates along the vertical axis by 90 degree counterclockwise, and which fo is followed by an additional 90 degree rotation from C1, C2 to the open state. 
which is also associated by with a alpha to pi helix transition in S6. So in consequence, the methionine 978, which is the gating residue in C0, which faces the lumen in the C0 state, flips nearly 180 degree and in the open state. Whereas the valine 976 in the C0 state also rotates up almost 180 degree from C0 to the open state and becomes the gain residues. So this 90 to 180 degree rotation result in drastic solvent accessibility change for residues on the S6 on the S6 helix, changing from facing the facing the solvent accessible lumen to facing the solvent inaccessible membrane by layer or vice versa. And second, we saw additional coils at the N and C terminal of S6 in a C0 state gradually uh, become he helical in a C0 or C1 and C2 state and finally adopt fully alpha helical structures in open state. And this cumulative effects thereby together extend the S6 by almost four turns from C0 to the open state and also lead to a register change at this linkage between S6 and the trip domain where this, glut glu uh, this glutamate 988 on end terminus of tryptomy in a C0 state uh, is relocated to the C terminus of the S6 helix in the open state. So we also identified, uh, to, sorry, to functionally probe the, the, the open state confirmation, we also identified a state dependence change in the, in the inter-subunit interface in the S6 gate. So the neighboring uh, port domain of uh, S5 and S, F, S5 and S6 helices are colored in green. And this symbol again uh, denotes the ion connection port. So the state dependent changes of S6 gate rearrange this methane 978 on S6 from facing the lumen in a C0 state to forming an interface with aspartate on S5 and glutamine residues on S. Mm, on S6, or S6 and this lysine residues on S45 linker from the neighboring port domain in open state. So this is a unusual interface arrangement because a hydrophobic side chain of methane faces three hydrophilic residues. So to we probe the uh, this state open state specific interface. So we used using double mutant psychoanalysis to examine the coupling between uh, among these four residues. So we first probed um, the coupling between uh, this aspartate and it, and with the methane. So we made single and corresponding double mutants, and we obtained a GV curve for each uh, mutant and compared the V half with the wild type channel, and we calculated the coupling energy. So the the V half of the D to N or M to D single uh, point mutation substantially right shifted the GV curve to much more positive membrane potential compared to the wild type channel showing, showing colored in, in, in black, indicating these point mutations destabilize the open state as it is much more difficult for uh, to open the channel by depolarization. However, the V half, uh, the, the v -half of the double mutant, D2N plus M2D colored in, in blue, uh, showed a similar V half to that of the, the wild type and with, uh, with a lot large coupling energy. So this data, corroborated that these two sites are, they, these two residues are, are energetic, energetically coupled in open state. And likewise, we found the coupling between this glutamine and the methionine residue are strongly uh, uh, energetically coupled based on the double mutant psychoanalysis and also the calculation of the coupling energy. Okay. So to understand the, the basis of the, this ligand induced channel activation, we made structural comparison between the physiological ground state C1 and the open state. So essentially the binding of PIP2 and choline agonists around VSLD induces a small local conformational change in S4B from 310 to alpha. And uh, this small change is propagated to the portal main through the S45, S4, 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 linker. The bending point on S5 uh, that forms the S45 linker uh, also change from uh, I, I changed by one almost one helical turn from isoleucine to phenylalanine. And this further this a translocation of the bending point also further helps further amplify the, the this conformational change 
of S5 because S5 is maintained, uh, maintains extensive interaction with the pore lining helix S6. So the movement of S, S5 is tightly coupled to S6, hence location away from the central axis, which finally leads to the dilation of the, the pore domain for channel opening. Okay, we also carried out detailed contact analysis on the C1 and open state structure. And specifically, we looked at residue interactions at the both intra-subunit and intra-subunit at the transmembrane domain. And we identified these three interfaces that undergo most substantial change dur during channel activation. So first, S6 undergoes lateral displacement. So we overlay C1 and open state structures and we see that S6 undergo um, a lateral displacement and also helical rotation. So the conformation, the, this conformation in open state is stabilized through intersubunit hydrophobic contacts with the neighboring S4, plus a intrasubunit hydrohydrogen bonding between this thrownin on, on S6 and this tryptophan on S5. And the second major interfacial change is amongst the trip domain S4B and S4-5 linker. So compared with the C1 state, the trip domain hacks much tighter against the VSLD and S4-5 uh, linker uh, in the open state. And this hydrophilic side chain of glutamine on the trip domain flips from the, the C1, in, flips from, uh, uh, yeah, flip, flips from, from the C1 to the open state and inserts itself to a hydrophobic group formed by the isoleucine residues on the S4-5 linker and also form hydrogen bond with thrownin on S4B. And this arrangement also, rearrangement also suggests a change in the solvent accessibility during channel activation. And lastly, the S3, uh, uh, no, uh, lastly, the S6, uh, S6 and trip domain connection region also undergo a coil to helix transition during activation and rearranging the interface between this uh, link linkage and the S4-5 linker as well as with the S5. And through hydrogen bonding and salt bridge interactions, this, this, this interface is stabilized at, uh, in the open state. Okay, so in summary of the work that I've shared today, um, we, we've shown the sites for cooling agonists and PIP2 binding are uh, surround S4 transmembrane helix S4, which function as a key nexus for channel gating of tripamate. And PIP2 binding couples multiple subdomains in both the transmembrane domain and the cytoplasmic domain, suggests its essential role in channel function. And the, in, this individual channel modulator together provide synergistic effects towards the gate to increase the channel open probability. And we've shown the mechanism for tripamate activation by PIP2 and ag cooling agonists by both structural and functional studies. And we observed large conformational change um, in the interface and in the interfaces and the coil to helical transition in S6 pore lining helix, as well as large electrostatic and solvent accessibility change in the pore domain during the, the channel activation. So taken together, we present that trip MA channel possesses a, such a cool and unique structure design for sensing cooling agonists and lipids. So with all that, I would like to thank my advisor, uh, Professor Sook Yang Lee at Duke University uh, Department of Biochemistry for all the, the, the tremendous support and guidance over the years during my PhD and my first postdoc. And also special thanks to all the former and current members from the Lee Lab and for their support in various aspects, including structural analysis, electrophysiology experiments, and crowd EM data collection and uh, pro data processing support. And I would like, also like to thank all the collaborators that we have we have had over the years, including Gabe Lander Lab at, uh, at, at Scripps, Huang Ke Yang Lab at Duke University, and uh, Wen Piu Ying at Lehigh Uni University for MD simulation support, and Mario Bonia at NIHS for crowd EM support. And thank the crowd EM facility at Duke, Smith, and PNCC for data collections and, and for NI, and, and, and NIH for fundings. And I'm happy to take questions from the audience. All right, thank you, Ying. All right, I think Connor has a question. Thanks, Leila. 
Hi, Ying. That, that was an amazing talk. Beautiful description of all these different potential transitions. My question is, do you know um, or is it known whether there are any endogenous molecules which might bind in either the type 1 or type 2 agonist sites? Um, endogenous? Uh, not really so far that we have not encountered any endogenous molecule that binds at the two agonist sites. Yeah. Thanks. There's a question from Meida. Hi, Ying. That was a gorgeous talk. Congratulations and really beautiful work. Uh, my question was regarding temperature gating. So how, you know, what are the conformational changes associated with temperature mediated gating in this channel? Oh, we, uh, we have not captured uh, any temperature induced uh, like open, open conformation for this channel. And obviously that's the that's the ultimate question now we are going after for this channel because it's the code sensor for our human Yeah, beings. but can you speculate based on uh, yes. you know the the so, models that you've so, come yes. up with so um, far? So one of the hypotheses now for temperature sensing is um, heat capacity change, which is basically mediated through salt and accessibility change in, mm -hmm. within the channel. And we don't think there um, it does well. Um, so we, I, I've, I've mentioned throughout the, the second part of my talk that we observed a large solvent accessibility change in, in this channel during the channel opening by, by PIP2 and the agonists, which include mm -hmm. the 90 to 180 degree flip rotation of the S6, which obviously involved large, like mm -hmm. a large uh, solvent accessibility change and other part of the channel the transmembrane domain also undergoes solvent accessibility change. So we think, you know, we speculate that we would likely observe similar patterns of conformational change undergo the temperature dependent channel gating. So that's our current speculation and hypothesis. All right, see you. Wow. Thank you. Right. I actually had a question, Ying. So, um, so with, I don't know if this is already in the literature, but has anyone tried to calculate um, sort of the energy required to go from like the, the APO state to the fully open state and figure out if, you know how that compares to the energy that's involved in, in cold gating. Uh, no, we I don't, theoretically it would be difficult to do that. And then we, we haven't done that also. And that would be something that we would like to measure like during not just uh, ligand gating or especially for temperature code mediated gating so that we have an idea about the 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 uh the like the energy required from for 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 channel activation for this for this channel yeah All right um so we have a question from an anonymous anonymous attendee who says great talk would it be possible to have a chimeric agonist acting as both type 1 and type 2 agonist or would it be structurally not possible to enter the channel thanks uh yeah thank you for the question and uh, uh so for drug design um it is yeah so because the based on the fact that type 1 and type 2 they they impose a synergistic effect so one idea that it um, personally, I've thought about it as to to link the type one and type two uh, moiety together, so we that uh, we have a uh, like fused molecule that so we can uh, we can impose both the type one and type two effect. Um, but uh, but but chemically, it might be difficult to achieve that because um, um, there might not be enough room to for the 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 compound to enter the occupy the binding site within the cavity as well as outside the cavity. So that's the challenging, the challenge. But it's a, it's a definitely a in, in, interesting and exciting direction to pursue. Um, if there are no more questions, then we can uh, you can all join me in thanking, thanking Ying. And um, we will see you next, next month. Okay, thank you everyone for the attend and attendance.